and welcome to the History of Africana Philosophy by G.K. Jeffers and Peter Adamson, brought to you with the support of the King's College London Philosophy Department and the LMU in Munich, online at historyofphilosophy.net. Today's episode, The Problem of the Color Line, Introducing the 20th Century. When we last saw W.E.B. Du Bois, intrepid hero of Africana philosophy, he was publishing his landmark contribution to sociology, the Philadelphia Negro, in the year 1899. But what would become of our hero in the new year, which inaugurated a new century? In the middle of June of 1900, he sailed the ocean blue, returning to Europe, with his first destination being Paris. He went there to attend the Exposition Universelle, a world's fair. It was truly a grand event, featuring the display of such major technological advances as the escalator, a moving sidewalk, and well before Buster Keaton made some of his greatest silent classics, the first projection of a film with recorded sound. Du Bois had been invited to help curate an exhibition of American Negroes for the American Pavilion. As part of this exhibition, Du Bois created a series of what we would now call infographics, charting in various statistical ways the evolution of African American life since the Civil War. These images feature striking uses of line, shape, and color, to the point where scholars have recently begun to celebrate them as impressive works of modernist art. In July, Du Bois attended another event, one that we have mentioned in previous episodes. This was the first ever Pan-African Conference, held in London from July 23rd to 25th. As we noted while discussing Frederick Alexander Durham, the conference was organized by Henry Sylvester Williams, a Trinidadian lawyer living in London. Prior to arriving in London, Williams began his study of the law at Dalhousie University in Halifax, Nova Scotia, which is, of course, the same institution that currently employs Chike. The conference brought together delegates from a wide variety of places. Among the most interesting was Benito Silvan, who also studied law and was a pioneering journalist, but is perhaps best known as a diplomat. He represented Haiti, first in London, and then most interestingly in Ethiopia, where he was appointed an aide-de-camp to the Emperor Menelik II. This happened after the historic victory of Ethiopia over Italy at the Battle of Adwa, an important moment of resistance to colonialism at a time when the African continent was becoming increasingly controlled in almost its totality by European powers. Because of his connection to the Ethiopian emperor, Sylvain was acknowledged as representing Ethiopia rather than Haiti. At the Pan-African Conference, Haiti was represented by a man already familiar to us, Antenor Firmin. Du Bois played a key role at the conference as the author of a speech entitled To the Nations of the World, which was adopted by its delegates as an official statement. It begins, In the metropolis of the modern world, in this the closing year of the 19th century, there has been assembled a congress of men and women of African blood to deliberate solemnly upon the present situation and outlook of the darker races of mankind. Notice that he saw the year 1900 as the last of the 19th century, not the first of the 20th. So if you count yourself among the pedants who insist that our current millennium only started in 2001, you have not just math on your side, but also Du Bois, a formidable combination. He then continues, the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line, the question as to how far differences of race, which show themselves chiefly in the color of the skin and the texture of the hair, are going to be made hereafter the basis of denying to over half the world the right of sharing to their utmost ability the opportunities and privileges of modern civilization. When writing his book, The Souls of Black Folk, a few years after the conference, he included the claim that the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line in the book's opening forethought, and then at both the beginning and the end of the book's second chapter. With the benefit of hindsight, many have seen his forethought as a perfectly accurate prophecy. We will see why in episodes to come. The conference was not overly radical in its demands, even while pressing for forms of responsible self-government in colonies in Africa and the Caribbean, to all the nations of the world takes the imperial rule of countries like Britain, France, Germany, and Belgium for granted, and seeks reform without demanding independence. Nineteen years later, in the wake of the First World War, Du Bois organized a new Pan-African conference in Paris, 
Failing to give Williams due credit as his predecessor, Du Bois referred to this meeting as the first Pan-African Congress, and it was not the last. Du Bois put on further events in 1921, 1923, and 1927. After a long break, a fifth Pan-African Congress took place in Manchester in 1945. George Padmore, a Trinidadian leftist activist, played an even greater role than Du Bois in organizing this meeting, which is widely agreed by scholars to be the most important Pan-African Congress of them all. In attendance were many young Africans who were ready to lead, a number of whom would go on to be the first prime ministers and presidents of independent African countries, Kwame Nkrumah of Ghana, Jomo Kenyatta of Kenya, and Hastings Banda of Malawi. The Fifth Pan-African Congress is thus retrospectively seen as an important step in the fight to free Africa from colonial domination. Ghana's independence in 1957 is then seen as the first major victory in this regard, followed by most of the other British, French, and Belgian colonies by the end of the 1960s. Armed struggle played a role in some of these efforts, most prominently in Kenya and Algeria, as it did in the 1970s, when the Portuguese colonies finally attained independence. The final decade of the 20th century saw the achievement of the last major goal of national liberation in Africa, the end of apartheid, and the first truly democratic election in South Africa in 1994. These political events formed the context for works of Africana philosophy concerning the nature of colonialism, its impact on both the colonized and the colonizer, the means of struggle against such oppression, and the aspirations of the new nations that won independence. If we now turn back to Du Bois's activities at the century's beginning, we can find another way into important themes of 20th century Africana philosophy. This is provided by the famous rivalry between Du Bois and Booker T. Washington. As we mentioned in our episode on Washington, things between them were not always acrimonious. Du Bois congratulated Washington on the success of the Atlanta Exposition Address, and even before that, Washington offered Du Bois a position at Tuskegee, though Du Bois turned it down because he'd already accepted his position at Wilberforce. In the year 1900, by which time Du Bois was at Atlanta University, he was again offered employment at Tuskegee, but declined again, this time because he thought it better to pursue a position as superintendent of schools for black children in Washington, D.C. Booker T. Washington at first agreed to support his candidacy for that position, but confusingly, then told him not to use the letter of recommendation he had written. This appears to have been the result of Washington realizing that his connections in D.C. disapproved of Du Bois getting the job. Du Bois did not get that job, which was perhaps the first source of friction between the two. It was a personal conflict with important philosophical implications and consequences. At the turn of the 20th century, Washington's power as a leader was truly unparalleled. The flow of money to black institutions and the appointment of black individuals to positions of significance was, to a great degree, subject to his influence. His level of control was bound to cause resentment and opposition. Reflecting on this many years afterward, Du Bois wrote, Contrary to most opinion, the controversy was not entirely against Mr. Washington's ideas, but became the insistence upon the right of other Negroes to have and express their ideas. Things came to such a pass that when any Negro complained or advocated a course of action, he was silenced with the remark that Mr. Washington did not agree with this. Naturally, the bumptious, irritated, young black intelligentsia of the day declared, I don't care a damn what Booker Washington thinks. This is what I think, and I have a right to think. Du Bois first expressed his own contrary thoughts, as respectfully as he could, in a 1901 review of Washington's autobiography, Up From Slavery. Two years later, he would revise and expand the review to create one of his most important statements of his political philosophy, the third chapter of The Souls of Black Folk. Entitled, Of Mr. Booker T. Washington and Others, it places Washington in a larger history of African American leadership, divided into three tendencies. First and oldest of the three is what he calls revolt or revenge, symbolized by slave uprisings. The other two tendencies are, by contrast, what Du Bois sees as forms of assimilation. One is what he refers to as adjustment or submission. He names Phyllis Wheatley, among others, as exemplifying a willingness to accept the limitations imposed by the larger society. The other he refers to variously as self-realization, self-development, or self-assertion, and it is clear that this tradition is the one with which he identifies. 
he associates it with Frederick Douglass, whom he calls the greatest of American Negro leaders, and whom he celebrates for standing until the end of his life for the ideals of his early manhood, ultimate assimilation through self-assertion, and on no other terms. Du Bois sees Washington, however, as deviating from this ideal by promoting adjustment and submission at precisely the time when a spirit of self-assertion is most needed. According to Du Bois, there are three key ways in which Washington's program for black advancement, with its accommodation of white prejudice, is not just undignified, but ultimately self-defeating. First, Washington aimed to encourage property and business ownership among African Americans, but from Du Bois's point of view, Washington failed to understand the close relationship between political and economic freedom in capitalist democracies. Du Bois argues that it is utterly impossible under modern competitive methods for working men and property owners to defend their rights and exist without the right of suffrage. Washington thought it was good tactics to concentrate on economic power first and save political power for later, but Du Bois is having none of this. To seek the one form of power without the other is to misunderstand both. Second, Washington aimed to inculcate personal virtues like thrift and self-respect in African Americans. What he failed to recognize in this case was the psychological consequences of asking African Americans to accept the second-class citizenship implied by segregation laws. This would undermine precisely the values so cherished by Washington by weakening self-esteem and banishing the optimism required for foresighted economic behavior. Third, Washington promoted basic schooling and industrial training at the expense of higher education. As Du Bois puts it, using his best gotcha voice, neither the Negro common schools nor Tuskegee itself could remain open a day were it not for teachers trained in Negro colleges or trained by their graduates. In other words, good teaching in the institutions promoted by Washington requires higher education so his devaluing of such education was, as with the previous points, ultimately self-undermining. Against Washington's contradictions, Du Bois advocates dogged pursuit of the right to vote, the end of legal segregation, and the education of youth according to ability. Now, Du Bois certainly did not think that higher education is for everyone. He famously elaborated the concept of the talented tenth, implicitly in the souls of black folk, and explicitly in an essay entitled The Talented Tenth, which was published in the same year, that is, 1903, a year that we can all agree fell in the 20th century. The idea is that we can only expect about a tenth of the population to have the aptitude required for higher studies and leadership. Those who fall into this talented group must be recognized and supported. This essay, The Talented Tenth, appeared in an edited volume entitled The Negro Problem, directly following an essay by Washington entitled Industrial Education for the Negro. Defending his position, Washington writes, I would not by any means have it understood that I would limit or circumscribe the mental development of the Negro student. By the side of industrial training should always go mental and moral training, but the pushing of mere abstract knowledge into the head means little. We want more than the mere performance of mental gymnastics. Our knowledge must be harnessed to the things of real life. I would encourage the Negro to secure all the mental strength, all the mental culture, whether gleaned from science, mathematics, history, language, or literature, that his circumstances will allow. But I believe most earnestly that for years to come, the education of the people of my race should be so directed that the greatest proportion of the mental strength of the masses will be brought to bear upon the everyday practical things of life, upon something that is needed to be done, and something which they will be permitted to do in the community in which they reside. The heat of this controversy turned up in July of 1903 with an incident that became known as the Boston Riot. William Monroe Trotter, editor of the black newspaper, The Boston Guardian, stood out as another of Washington's most outspoken critics. When Washington came to speak in Boston that month, Trotter and others aligned with him intentionally disrupted the meeting. With a crowd full of Bookerites and anti-Bookerites, things got wilder than expected. The results included some slapstick worthy of Buster Keaton. T. Thomas Fortune, at the time a supporter of Washington, broke out into a sneezing fit because someone had sprinkled cayenne pepper on the rostrum where he was speaking. But the physical violence that soon followed was no laughing matter. Trotter, who stood on a pew and heckled Washington amidst the melee, was jailed 
and Washington planned to sue him. Du Bois was not present at the Boston riot and did not condone Trotter's actions, but the lines were drawn and leading black activists needed to pick a side. Du Bois duly found himself an ally of Trotter. Du Bois's leadership of the opposition to the Tuskegee machine, as he and others referred to Washington and his influence, was a literary and philosophical fact, starting with the publication of The Souls of Black Folk, but it became an institutional fact as well in the summer of 1905. This is when he organized the first meeting of what would become known as the Niagara Movement, named after the location of the first meeting at Fort Erie, Ontario, on the Niagara River. It was a landmark organization, a new eruption of militancy in pursuit of full and equal rights for African Americans. Yet it was also short lived. After a few years, a rift between Du Bois and Trotter played a major factor in its faltering. The last annual meeting of the Niagara Movement took place in 1908. That same year, a major race riot in Springfield, Illinois, resulted in terrible death and destruction, and this event helped to inspire the creation of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP, in the following year. The organization brought together leading black and white activists, including Du Bois. The Niagara movement has thus come to be viewed in retrospect as the precursor to the NAACP, which would over the coming decades be at the forefront of the fight for civil rights. Du Bois left his position at Atlanta University to serve on the new organization's executive and as the editor of its official journal, The Crisis. Meanwhile, in 1915, Washington died, bringing the rivalry to a close. Over the course of decades to come, there would be other intense controversies over the correct response to America's structures of white supremacy, with some of these debates again involving Du Bois. In 1916, Marcus Garvey moved from Jamaica to the United States, leading to the massive expansion of his organization, the Universal Negro Improvement Association. By the 1920s, he was the world's most successful black organizer. As it happens, before he moved to the U.S., Garvey was influenced in his path toward leadership by reading Washington's Up From Slavery. There are many differences between Washington and Garvey, but like Washington before him, Garvey became a major rival of Du Bois. Again, the two clashed over what was required for black progress. Was the main thing to oppose segregation or to build the black community up from within? By the early 1930s, though, Du Bois himself began to doubt whether racial integration was worth the energy he was putting into it. In a series of editorials in The Crisis, he argued that it was more important for African Americans to strive for economic cooperation than to focus on the long-term goal of ending segregation. This change of mind caused predictable conflict with the rest of the NAACP leadership and led to his resignation from his positions in the organization. He returned to Atlanta University, although he did come back to the NAACP after being forced to retire from his professorship in 1944. He worked for the organization for four more years, with his achievements in that time including An Appeal to the World, a pioneering UN petition put together and partially written by Du Bois. It called attention to the human rights violations at stake in the treatment of African Americans. It is, of course, the 1950s and 1960s that saw the greatest push for civil and political rights led by the NAACP and other organizations, like the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, the Congress of Racial Equality, the National Urban League, and others. This was a turbulent time for Du Bois. It is not too much of an exaggeration or distortion to say that each decade of the 20th century saw him move further and further to the left. This naturally resulted in him being isolated from the mainstream of the civil rights movement given the context of the Cold War. In 1961, he left the United States to go live in Ghana, invited there by President Nkrumah to work on a project he had long cherished, the Encyclopedia Africana. He died in Ghana on August 27, 1963, the day before the most iconic protest of the movement, namely the March on Washington, which featured Martin Luther King Jr.'s famous I Have a Dream speech. In another address on that day, Roy Wilkins, then head of the NAACP, announced Du Bois' death to the humongous crowd gathered on the National Mall. He neatly tied together the opening two-thirds of this century of Africana thought by saying, regardless of the fact that in his later years Dr. Du Bois chose another path, it is incontrovertible 
that at the dawn of the 20th century, his was the voice that was calling to you to gather here today in this cause. If you want to read something that applies to 1963, go back and get a volume of The Souls of Black Folk by Du Bois, published in 1903. The next few years would see the passage of the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act, major achievements by the civil rights movement. Yet it would be misleading to tell the story of the 1950s and 1960s without looking beyond the fight against legalized exclusion. Some, like Washington, Garvey, and even the Du Bois of the 1930s, saw a focus on integration as a dubious proposition. Elijah Muhammad's Nation of Islam certainly sticks out here, along with its greatest spokesman, Malcolm X. We will have more to say about the group's beliefs later. For now, we'll note simply that there was friction between the nation and traditional civil rights organizations, because the nation focused on helping black people to help themselves, rather than seeking to reform America. As the 1960s went on, and the civil rights movement transformed into the black power movement, the tension between these two goals of autonomous self-help on the one hand, and the transformation of the country in an anti-racist direction on the other hand, bubbled to the surface. Just as we ended our first story about colonialism and its defeat with the first truly democratic election in South Africa in 1994, so it makes sense to end this second story with the Million Man March in 1995, organized by the current leader of the Nation of Islam, Louis Farrakhan. It took place on the National Mall, just as the March on Washington did before it. But rather than being a protest seeking to change American laws, this gathering emphasized the ability of African American men to come together in order to bring change to their communities. There were, of course, varying opinions on the ideas of male responsibility promoted by the Million Man March. For example, the philosopher and activist Angela Davis joined with others to criticize it in a statement that read in part, justice cannot be served by countering a distorted racist view of black manhood with a narrowly sexist vision of men standing a degree above women. This controversy reminds us to rewind to 1900 one last time. We have mentioned Du Bois's participation in the 1900 Pan-African Conference, but it is just as important to remember that Anna Julia Cooper was also there in London at this path-breaking event. Also instructive is the story of Ida B. Wells' role in the founding of the NAACP. Along with Mary Church Terrell, she was one of two black women to be a founding member. There has long been controversy over her exclusion from the Committee of Forty, an interim governing body selected at the organization's first conference. She was particularly disappointed in Du Bois's failure to keep her on the list. He apologized to her and offered to try to reverse the decision, but in her own words, my anger at having been treated in such a fashion outweighed my judgment and I again left the building. Wells remained involved with the organization in its early years, but after getting off to this bad start, she was increasingly alienated from the NAACP and ultimately severed ties. As that vignette shows, there has long been a failure to appreciate the tireless efforts of Africana women thinkers and activists. This is a mistake we'll be aiming to avoid. We will certainly discuss the remarkable career of Marcus Garvey, for example, but we'll also acknowledge the two Amy Garveys. He was first married to Amy Ashwood and then after that to Amy Jakes, both of them leaders in their own right. One of the other ways women thinkers led the way in the 20th century is through creative writing, as many of the most important novelists, poets, and playwrights of the Black world in this period were women. This would include African authors like Ama Ata Aidu from Ghana, Bessie Head from South Africa, Buchi Emecheta from Nigeria, Mariama Ba from Senegal, and Tsitsi Dangarenga from Zimbabwe. In the Caribbean, the same island of Jamaica that produced the two Amy Garveys gave us the storyteller and poet Louise Bennett, popularly known as Miss Lou, and Una Marson, a poet, playwright, and journalist with whom we can draw an interesting parallel with Benito Sylvain. Just as Sylvain once represented Menelik II, Marson served as secretary to Haile Selassie, Ethiopia's last emperor, during his time in Europe after the Italian invasion and occupation of Ethiopia in 1935. Finally, there were African-American writers like Nella Larson, Zora Neale Hurston, Lorraine Hansberry, Maya Angelou, Toni Morrison, Alice Walker, and Octavia Butler, and we're confident that by keeping that list to just seven names, we've prompted some listeners to think of others that are obviously missing. In the episodes to come, then, 
we will explore the various themes covered in this episode, from Pan-Africanism to the question of integration versus separation to the issue of gender. We will meet many different thinkers from Africa and its diaspora, investigating how they shaped the trajectory of Africana thought over the course of this momentous century. As we embark on this ambitious new series, we won't be in entirely unfamiliar territory. Our subject next time will be yet another organization in which Du Bois played a leading role, the American Negro Academy. The ANA has come up already in episodes on its founder, Alexander Crummel, and on Du Bois, a founding member. But by devoting an entire episode to this pioneering group, we will have a chance to cover other leading African-American intellectuals of the early 20th century, like Kelly Miller and William H. Ferris. So join us as we turn the wheel of time back to the start of the last century, whenever exactly that was, here on The History of Africana Philosophy. <laughs>